Okay, so where to start? Um, uh, first of all, let me say the uh, possible, uh, the order of topics I'm planning on doing. Um, let me see, my pencil isn't working. There we go. One. Well, first I want to introduce the space. I'm going to talk about it as a space of marked graphs. Uh, give the space a name. It's called outer space. And uh, then talk a little bit about projective length functions. So that's a way of understanding what uh, points in the space look like. Uh, this is going to be a space on which a group of automorphisms acts. In fact, it's going to be a group of outer automorphisms. So that's why it's called outer space. Uh, next, I want to talk about another view of outer space from the point of view of sphere complexes. which if you're familiar with curve complexes, they're a lot like curve complexes, only it's spheres instead of curves. And talking about that makes it easy to talk about various variations of outer space. And, uh, and maps between them. And so I'll describe these things and explain what, what, uh, what good it is having maps between these spaces. The next thing I'll concentrate on is the quotients of these spaces by these actions. So those are moduli spaces of graphs. And using these moduli spaces, we'll be able to compute various um, topological invariance of these groups. And for, by topological invariance, um, I mean in particular uh, cohomology. And then, well, we'll see how far we get. But other things I would like to talk about is um, variations on these spaces that have to do with uh, different ways of compactifying the quotient. These are called bordifications. And uh, in addition, I said I'm interested in the topology of these moduli spaces, so uh, I might talk about the Euler characteristic. Of moduli spaces. And this leads in all sorts of uh, fascinating directions, uh, in particular. Uh, well, I'll just say fancy words and not explain it unless I get to this. Uh, quantum field theories, quantum field theory techniques, and uh, Kondosevich's graph complexes. So I haven't defined a single thing that I've written down on this on this piece of paper yet. So, um, but. That's uh, just, uh, as you learn what these things are, you can go back to this list and see how far we're actually getting. So yeah, whoops, not ready for that yet. Um, okay, so where do I start? Um, well, I think I'm gonna start in the 1980s.
uh, with the introduction of this space that I mentioned. This is certainly not the first time people started thinking about automorphisms of free groups. It's been um, an active topic since the 1920s, at least. I gave a course at IHES uh, in a couple of years ago in, in, uh, 20, in 2019, in which I talked about some of those um, things that people had figured out before the 1980s. Uh, people like Magnus and Whitehead. Uh, Magnus, Whitehead, Nielsen, up into Stallings in the 1970s. These guys are in the, started in the 1920s. Uh, so if you're interested in the prehistory before 1980, uh, I suggest looking at uh, my HES course. It was recorded and is still online. But um, yeah, so what happened in this in the mid 1980s? Well, uh, Mark Culler uh, wrote a thesis about automorphism groups of free groups. In fact, he was a student of Stallings. So he was interested in automorphisms of free groups and in three manifolds. And if you're interested in three manifolds, then you're also interested in mapping class groups of surfaces, all of those things. And he proved uh, a realization theorem. For finite groups of automorphisms of a free group. So the theorem is supposing you have a finite subgroup of uh, automorphisms, well, of outer automorphisms. So those are automorphisms, modulo inner automorphisms. And the theorem says that uh, F can be realized on a mark as uh, on a marked graph. So there's a couple of uh, words I have to, what does this mean? This is theorem. So what does it mean? I can realize a finite group of automorphisms on a marked graph. Oops, I keep doing that. You don't get to see that picture until later. Uh, what does this mean? Well, uh, so G is the graph. and it's marked. Well, a, a fundamental group of a graph is always a free group. So a marking is just an identification of the fundamental group of the graph with the free group. Well, an isomorphism. Uh, Whoops. Uh, Fn to 
phi one of G. Of course, to talk about an isomor a fundamental group, you have to have a base point, but let's ignore that for the moment. So if I have um, a, an automorphism of the graph, then I get an induced map on the fundamental group. Well, let's give it a base point. Uh, so that's an automorphism, so it's got an inverse. So this map on fundamental groups is actually an isomorphism. But of course, the fundamental group on the right isn't the same as the fundamental group on the left because it's got a different base point. But we can identify it with the fundamental group on the left by choosing a path from uh, B to alpha of B. So that's an isomorphism that depends on a path Okay, so given a graph automorphism, we get an uh, automorphism of the fundamental group if we have an identification of the fundamental group with a free group. Uh, let me give that a name, let's call it G star. Uh, then it looks like we get a, an automorphism of the free group. However, this automorphism is not well defined. In order to uh, identify the these two fundamental groups, we needed to choose a path from B to alpha of B. If we chose a different path, you know from elementary algebraic topology that the, um, the well, the, the difference in those item automorph on those in those isomorphisms is an inner automorphism of uh, pi one of GB. So you get not an automorphism here, but you just get an outer automorphism. Okay, so uh, given, an, given an isomorphism of the, of the free group with the fundamental group of the graph and a graph automorphism, you get an outer automorphism of the free group. So uh, what does, uh, so if you have your finite group, we had, uh, I guess I called it F, maybe that's a bad choice in name. is realized on G with this particular marking if every automorphism, uh, well, if every element of G can be realized by an automorphism of the graph. So um, on the level of spaces, so, so yeah, this picture here is all on the level of the fundamental groups and isomorphisms between the fundamental groups. You can also kind of do all this without uh, passing to the fundamental group by just looking at the level of spaces. and uh, maps instead of 
of uh, groups. So how do you do that? You identify the free group, Fn, say it's free on n basis elements, a1 up to an, with the fundamental group of uh, Rn, where Rn is a rose, which looks like this. It's got n petals labeled a1, a2, up to an. I should probably make it red because it's a rose. Um, right. So then, then you can always, if you have an automorphism, Well, you can always realize this automorphism as a homotopy equivalence of the rows. Uh, so there's a map F alpha that goes through the rows to the rows. If uh, alpha of ai is some word wi then you just send the loop ai maybe i should call it loop ai goes to you just spell out the word in uh the rows um, by wi Okay, so you can you can think of instead of uh, automorphisms of the free group, you can think of uh, homotopy equivalences of the rows, and it's an exercise. Well, note first of all, if I have two different homotopic maps, So, so what's the point here? Fn is the fundamental group of the rows. So if I start with F alpha and I look at the induced map on the fundamental group, I get alpha. So, and if I have two, two different homotopy equivalences for the rows, they give me the same map on on uh, pi one. So in fact, um, if I take a homotopy equivalence of the rows, I get an element of the outer automorphism group of Fn. And homotopic maps give me the same, uh, and I've just kind of indicated why this should, map should be surjective. And homotopy map, homotopic maps give homotopic maps give me the same outer automorphism. So uh, I actually get a map from homotopy classes of maps of homotopy equivalences of the rows to out of Fn, and it's an exercise. Maybe I'll put this on the next page. Uh, exercise to prove that this map is actually an isomorphism. Okay, so I can think of out of Fn, or I can think of homotopy equivalences of the rows up to homotopy, and I'm good. So let me just do a, an example here. Um, it's going to all fit on one page, maybe not. Okay, let's take a, a graph. There's a graph. Give it a base point there. And uh, let's, we want to identify its fundamental group with the fundamental group of rows. So let's uh, take the map 
there's my our, my fundamental art rows on two petals. Maybe I should call these A and B. And uh, I'm going to take a, a map. So, so that's, uh, I, what is this map? I'm going to collapse the middle edge. OK, so uh, in other words, A will correspond to this loop. And B will correspond to this loop. OK, so let me take another copy of that. Oops. Yeah, I'm going to erase this for the moment. Uh, that's going to another copy of that. And uh, now I'm going to perform an automorphism of my graph, which is switch the left two edges. So what will happen to the loop A? Well, the loop A, which used to go around uh, counterclockwise, Clockwise is now going to go around counterclockwise. And what happens to the root B, the loop B, instead of going there, is going to go all the way around there. So in other words, when I collapse, collapse the, remember this, this map is collapsing the middle edge. So what happens to the loop A? A goes to its inverse. And B, well, it goes around uh, B and A. B and A, B and A inverse, B and A inverse. OK, so that gives me an automorphism of the free group. And you won't be surprised to learn that it has order two. Because if you switch, switching those two edges is an order two automorphism of the graph. OK, so that's marked graphs and uh, how you, and the fact that you can realize um, automorphisms of a finite group of automorphisms of the free group by automorphisms of the graph is a, is a theorem. Not supposed to be obvious. OK, so a little history. So that was kind of Mark's history. And then um, I was also involved in this. So I was actually interested in cohomology of matrix groups. In particular, um, there's something called homology stability, which says that, well, uh, if you've got some series of matrix groups that keeps getting bigger and bigger, and you look at, uh, say, the ith homology, is there some point where the ith homology never, ch never changes? That's called homology stability. Uh, well, maybe I'll just write that. But in particular, how do you prove theorems like uh, this? Well, you look at the action of um, your groups, your matrix groups on a space and study what happens to the uh, spaces as the size of the matrix group grows bigger. And so what spaces you use uh, 
um, you use the symmetric spaces. Uh, and related spaces and spaces that are related to symmet symmetric spaces, such as Tietz buildings. So Thurston noticed that uh, you can use Teichmuller space as kind of a replacement for a symmetric space if you're interested in studying mapping class groups of surfaces instead of matrix groups. So those are map mod S sub G means mapping class groups of the surface. Okay, so I wanted uh, so Mark was interested in automorphisms of free groups. Um, and we both knew that Thurston was using Teichmiller space like a symmetric space. And I like symmetric spaces, so Mark and I made a space called Outer Space. It's an analog of both symmetric spaces and Teichmiller space. And I'm saying this because. Uh, Somehow the analog analogy with symmetric spaces sometimes gets lost a bit in because the analogy with Teichmiller spaces has become has been so powerful. Right. So that's just a little little uh little uh, excursion in history. Um, but let's, uh, let's get down now to uh, studying exactly what is, uh, what is, so what is this space? Well, you already know what the points are. They're gonna be marked graphs. And we've seen that by a marked graph, I can either, either talk about an isomorphism of its fundamental group with a free group, or I can talk about a homotopy equivalence of a rose with the, the, the graph. And that's the point of view that we, we, uh, we use. So uh, points are a graph and a, uh, um, a map where G goes from, is a homotopy equivalence to G. But actually I left out an adjective. Uh, they're not just marked graphs, they're marked metric graphs. So what is a, how do you, how do you get a, what's a metric graph? Well, you make the graph into a metric space using the path metric induced by making all of the edges isometric to intervals of the reals. Well, let's just say giving edges length uh, lengths uh, L sub 
e bigger than zero. So if I have a graph, I don't just think of it as a graph. I give it its length edges, uh, one and a half, two th thirds, i, something like that. Real numbers, positive real numbers. Um, right. So why does this help? The point is, if you think about how you move around in a symmetric space, let's look at the symmetric space of lattices in R to the N. Well, if you have a lattice, it's got, you can choose a basis. And if you deform the basis a little bit, if you wiggle, uh, so how do you move in the symmetric space? You move around the symmetric space by wiggling the basis for a lattice. Uh, the symmetric space is uh, lattices with bases. Uh, So the wiggly base and you move around and that has the effect of uh, changing the flat metric on the quotient torus. Now it deforms the flat metric on the quotient torus. And how do you move around to Teichmiller space? Well, you wiggle the hyperbolic uh, Teichmiller space you can think of as a space of hyperbolic metrics. Uh, you uh, change the length, you deform the metric a little bit. So obviously, what do you do in the space of, um, of marked graphs? Well, you vary the metric a little bit. So if you don't have a metric, you can't vary it and you can't move around. So that's why we have a metric. Um, I guess I should give outer space a name. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to call it CVN. Uh, You uh, move around by varying the lengths of, met of the lengths of edges. So let me give a more formal definition then. Um, Uh, CVN is the space, uh, well, as a set. Well, let me just say the points in CVN. Are, mar are marked metric graphs. G, G, but we want a few caveats here. We don't just want any old, old graph. We want uh, uh, them to be finite. We don't want them to have bivalent vertices because if you just stick some bivalent vertices in a graph, you get a homeomorphic thing and we're topologists. So we only care about things up to homeomorphism. So no bivalent vertices. And for today, at least, let's not have any leaves either. Or no uh, univalent vertices. Um, so in other words, every vertex has at least three edges coming out of it. 
uh, and real lengths L sub B have to be positive. Uh, that's enough. Um, there's another uh, thing. If you're in in the US, you might measure the length of your graph edges in inches. Or, but if you're in the UK, you might measure them in centimeters. But they're still the same graph. We don't really care what your unit of measurement is when you're talking about the lengths of the edges. So we often normalize. So scale, I'm saying that uh, scaling length edges, all, all length edges by the same number, we don't want that to be a different point. Uh, In other words, so we can fix that, for instance, by normalizing so that the sum of all of the lengths is one. Okay, so that's uh, points, they're marked metric graphs that, that uh, so I should. I'll just draw a picture. There's a graph. There's the marking. Here's a rose. Um, yeah, I guess my markings go the other way. Okay, and then what G is a, a homotopy equivalence. And when do I consider two of these pictures the same? Uh, G, G is the same as G prime, G prime. Well, if the graphs are isometric and the, uh, and the marking observes the, the isometry, then I want them to be the same point. So in other words, if they're, is an isometry from G to G prime. And I have a marking over here, G, and I have a marking over here, G prime. Uh, and I want uh, H of G to be, well, not exactly equal to necessarily, but homotopic to G prime. So notice in particular, supposing I have an isometry of G to itself, which is what we saw earlier. Uh, G. Uh, and this is H of G. And this point, well, th this, this diagram commutes on the nose. So the point G, G is the same as the point G, H of G. Okay, so, right. So that's, a, that's a, so, so far all I've done, done is describe this as a set of points. Uh, how do I get it to, how do I make it into a topological space? Well, every time I have a marked graph, I can uh, think of it as one of a whole family of, part of uh, marked graphs that actually forms a simplex. So for instance, that's my marked graph. Uh, it's got lengths 
L1, L2, and L3, and the sum of the lengths is one. It also comes, of course, with a marking. But if I vary the lengths of the edges, that won't change the marking. So I get a whole simplex L1, L2, L3 of points. This is the point. The, this triangle here is the L1 plus L2 plus L3 equals one. And uh, Right, so every point in this triangle corresponds to a different point in this space. Uh, they all come with very similar looking markings, but they're different points in the space. So that's called sigma of GG. There's one, one simplex for each combinatorial mark graph. Okay, and, and uh, we have face maps. If I let uh, L3 go to zero, L2, that was L2. If I let the middle edge go to zero, I get this. That's, I just have two lengths, L1 and L3 left. So that corresponds to a one-dimensional simplex, and I can see it in this picture, it's right there. So um, here's what I say formally, if uh, sigma of g, g is a, uh, has tau of g prime, g prime as a face, if there's some forest in G, a forest is just a, a subgraph with no cycles, a bunch of trees. So that when I collapse the forest, I get uh, I get a, a map, an induced map, uh, C for forest collapse, G, C of G. And I want the point on the right, which is a point in outer space, to be equivalent to G prime, G prime. And I don't have room to say this on this slide, so I'll move it to the next slide. Uh, there's a face map such that uh, GF, uh, G mod F, C of G is equivalent to G, G, G prime, G prime. Okay, so that's, I mean, the picture is clear. You just have to write it down in, in symbols. And then CVN, the whole space, is a disjoint union of all of these sigma of GGs, modulo the equivalence relation given by face maps. So I have this uh, one simplex given that corresponds to this graph with two edges. And I can think of that, you, you already saw how I can think of that as a face of the simplex uh, with, a, with that edge, the barbell simplex, but I can also think of that as um, a, a face of that simplex. But this, marked graph is the same. Remember, if I perform an isometry of this graph, like just flip the B edge over, that's the same, that's the same uh, simplex that in the middle there, 
but it's a face of a different triangle, namely where A goes up and B goes down. It's the same graph, but it's got a different marking. So this face is in both of those things. So, uh, right. So point here is equivalent to point here, is equivalent to point here, and is also equivalent to a point on that other triangle that was in the other page. Uh, yeah. Okay. So now, now you can see the picture for n equals two. That's a picture for n equals two. Um, here, I guess I, I called my generators of the free group AB, uh, XY instead of AB. And you can see the graphs we were just talking about. Uh, there's one of them, and uh, there's the other one. They agree on an edge. And there's, but there's lots of other ways to mark this graph. Uh, yeah, there's lots of other ways in the, the triangles glue together like that. So uh, let's see, let me write down a couple more exercises. So this is a picture of CV2. Exercise is that uh, the dimension of this space is 3n minus 4. So the biggest simplex I can have, I can make, sigma of gg has uh, dimension 3n minus 4. And this is a result of the fact that I've restricted the, the class of graphs that I'm allowed to use. Otherwise, that wouldn't be true. Um, right. So you notice there's all these yellow fins, and they look like they're kind of unnecessary to the whole picture. And in fact, you can just shrink them if you like. Uh, and you get something called uh, reduced outer space. Which looks like that. I've marked all those vertices in green because none of the vertices are actually in outer space because you shrunk a loop to get to the vertices. So in here too, there's lots of this picture that's not actually, the interior of all those simplices is in outer space, but um, the top edges of the uh, yellow triangles are not in outer space and the vertices of the blue triangles are not in outer space because to get to an edge like that, you have to shrink a loop. And you're not allowed to shrink a loop in outer space. Because all your graphs still have to have fundamental group Fn. So, um, right. So in general, you take, uh, there's a deformation retraction from um, outer space to out reduced outer space. And it's uh, given g, g, you get to, uh, you shrink all separating edges. And you can check that that's a continuous deformation retraction. Okay, uh, right. So I made a space. What's it got to do with out of Fn? Well, we already know something about it. What's the action of out of Fn? Well, if I have a point, that's a map. That's uh, a graph and a marking. I'll just put the whole thing in that symbol. Uh, if I have an alpha, in out of Fn, I realize it by uh, homotopy equivalence from Rn to itself. And then there's my original point. I have 
F alpha, realizing the automorphism, and I get G of F alpha as a new point. So I say that uh, GG acted on by alpha is G, G, G of F alpha. So I have a right action on outer space. And exercise to see whether you uh, digested all this. Uh, prove. Oh, Karen, sorry. Yeah. Can you just uh, go back one slide, one slide, please? Yeah. Yeah, this picture. Uh, okay, thank you. That was a request of the audience. <laughs> okay. Um, the exercise is to prove that the state, so this gives you an action of this group, prove the stabilizer of a point is isomorphic to the automorphism group of the graph. So this is kind of a, uh, did you digest what I said about marked graphs and finite and uh, group actions? Okay. Um, right. So another thing you might notice about this picture that uh, also I wanted me to go back to is that's actually a manifold. Whereas the picture I drew here, that's not a manifold. Um, it's got, yeah. So you might wonder whether uh, reduced outer space is always a manifold. So that's an extra exercise. CV and reduced is not a manifold for n at least three. Okay. Uh, let's see, where are we? 11.04. How am I, when I'm, I'm supposed to go to 11.30, Yeah, uh, UK time, yeah, it's uh, 11.20, I think. No, what's, yes. that's correct, 20. I think it's 11.25, actually. I started 11.10. Yeah, yes. so that makes 25. Uh, so there's other spaces related uh, that I should mention. Um, the spine. So we've got outer space decomposed as a union of open simplices. So, and we've got this uh, space relation that gives a partially ordered, that makes this set of simplices into a partially so ordered set. So, the set of uh, G, a sigma of GG is a partially ordered set. O set. Uh, uh, where the, the ordering is the phase relation. So whenever you have a partially ordered set, you can make a simplicial complex where a simplex is just a chain in the partially ordered set. It's called uh, the geometric realization. Of this post set is called the spine. of uh, outer space. Uh, so a simplex, it's a simplicial complex. It's got a simplex. Whenever you have a chain of K uh, faces, And the claim is that you can actually see put Kn inside of CVN by sending uh, sigma of G G 
to the bare center. So let me just show you how that works. Uh, need a, another page. I better get another. Let me just do it on the on this piece, um, on the reduced part because it's easier to see. Okay, how do I get? Uh, so I'm supposed to put a vertex in the bare center of every simplex. And then I get a, well, in this case, I'm only going to get one simplices because there's not very long chains, but I get a one simplex going to all those faces, all those faces, all those faces, et cetera. So now you can see why I called it the spine. It kind of looks like a spine. It goes on infinitely often. Okay, so now it's probably time to actually state the theorem that Mark and I proved in 1986. So actually what we proved is that uh, the spine of reduced outer space is contractible. Uh, and then, uh, but so that implies that all these other spaces are contractible. And oh, yeah, so. Uh, Another exercise is show the dimension of the spine is 2n minus 3. The longest chain you can make of forests in an admissible graph is uh, 2n minus 3. OK, now in the what remains of this period, I want to give you a different view of outer space. It was called a bird's eye view. Of outer space. Oh, called outer space. Okay. Why, why am I calling it a bird's eye view? Because uh, birds sit in trees. And uh, we're going to look at this outer space from the point of view of trees. So supposing you have a point G, G in CBN. Well, the fundamental, uh, fundamental group of, uh, of G acts on the universal cover of G. The universal cover of a graph is a tree. And G, of course, identifies pi one of G with Fn. So we get uh, an action of Fn on a tree. And it's not just a tree, it's got a metric on it. Uh, it's a simplicial tree. And uh, the action is free. I should say that. You get a free action. Of Fn on a metric simplicial tree. Uh, right. Oh, yeah, and by isometries. OK, so that's, that's nice. Um, so we'll think of this as uh, instead of, so GG gives an action of G into the group of isometries of G tilde. And an autom what does an automorphism do? And automorphism 
Well, it just twists twists this action. So let me bring that to the next page. So if I start with an action, G to the isometries, I mean, oh, FN, sorry. An action to the free group. You guys aren't awake. I used to say that I deliberately made typos to see whether my audience was still awake. Um, I actually don't deliberately make typos, but I do make a lot of typos. Okay, twist this action. So we have an action uh, row into the isometries of G tilde, and we have an automorphism of the free group. And so we get a new action row composed with alpha. Uh, and if alpha is inner, then the action isn't really very different. So there's an isometry of the tree to itself commuting with the action. So they're, they're basically the same. So, so we get an action of out of FN on, so yeah. So now we can make a new definition of CBN. It's the space of free actions, minimal actions. of Fn on metric simplicial trees. Up to scaling. Uh, right. Uh, I didn't say what minimal means. Minimal is a consequence of the fact that we weren't allowing, um, we had finite graphs and we weren't allowing any uh, leaves. So that means, so that translates to the fact that uh, there's no invariant uh, subtree under this action. Uh, right. So, so this is a space of actions, but I have to say when two of them are the same. Uh, I got an action of Fn, the isometries of T1 and row two from Fn to the isometries of T2. Then I get, uh, uh, row one is equivalent to row two if there's an isometry between T1 and T2. That commutes with the action. In other words, if I apply the isometry row one of G to T1, and I apply row two of G to T2, this diagram commutes. So it's what you'd expect. The actions are the same. Let's see, 17. I think I still have five minutes. So, um, so now we, we moved from a space of marked graphs to a space of actions on trees. Now I want to move, I want to, uh, try to get a little bit closer to what Remy was talking about earlier and uh, 
talk about how you might so this space is definitely not compact all these simplices had missing faces for instance um, so the next question is how you might compactify this space in order to do things like remedas so the way this was done originally is uh, using work of Ian Chiswell actually given a free action of Fn on a metric simplicial tree. You can define a length function is uh, going to measure the length of elements of the free group. So this is rho is the name of this action. Uh, so it's going to be a, a row. I've used L for length in, in lots of different bases, places. I hope it's not confusing. And you define it by what's the length of G? Well, that's the smallest distance any point is moved by a row of G. And it turns out to be actually the minimum, not just the end. Okay, so given an action on a tree, you get this length function. And it's easy to check that uh, conjugate elements, um, I guess, since I'm short on si size, this too will be an exercise. Uh, G and H, G, H inverse have the same length. So if uh, C is a set of conjugacy classes, in Fn, then actually L sub rho goes from conjugacy classes to R bigger than zero. And the theorem uh, well it's really based at work on Chiswell, but it was uh, modified by uh, Color and Morgan, and independently by Alpern and Bass. At the same time, uh, Bass and Morgan were at the same institution, Columbia, working on the same problem in offices next door without knowing it, knowing that they were working on the same thing. Uh, the theorem is that a free action of Fn on a metric simplicial tree. So uh, is determined by its length function. So why do we care? Well, we got this, uh, this gives a way of putting CVN into a space of length functions. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Let me, let me say this quicker. I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, let me say this more directly. So the length function uh, goes from set of conjugacy classes into R bigger than zero. We, uh, so we could think of that as, we could say that L sub rho is sitting inside of uh, R, bigger than zero to the set of conjugacy classes. Get one number for every conjugacy class. 
But in fact, we don't care about scaling the length function. So this length function we could think of instead of sitting in this thing, we could think of it sitting in the projective space. Since we since we missed zero, we never get we know it's a free action, so there's no fixed points. So we never have length zero for anything. Uh, you can say, in fact, the length function goes into this projective space. So what the theorem says is that um, CVN embeds into this space of projective length functions. And then uh, Color and Morgan proved that uh, the image is uh, the closure of the image. is compact. You have an infinite dimensional projective space, so it's not true that the closure of every set is compact, but the closure of the image of CVN is compact. And I'm just gonna end with a picture of, um, I think I'm gonna end with a picture. Hmm. I'm gonna end with a picture of the embedding for n equals two. But it looks like I have to uh, go to a different file to find that. OK, so there's a picture of the embedding into the space of projective length functions for n equals two. That was in a paper by Mark Culler and myself. Um, a long time ago. And if you just look at it, so it's kind of hard to see what's going on here. Uh, if you just look at the part given by uh, reduced outer space, here's a picture of the embedding of the reduced outer space into the space of projective length functions. And right, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this embedding, uh, I guess next time but i'm out of time now yes thank you karen